With the emergence of molecular diagnostics and new therapeutics, the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia, or AML, is entering a new era. I'd like to ask Jeff, what is your approach to the treatment of AML based on age, risk, and risk stratification, if you could enlighten us? Um, yeah, well, after I take a couple of Tylenol and get rid of my headache, um, <laughs> thinking about this, um, there's, there's not a, a very standardized approach uh, to treatment of AML based on age and risk. I think it's constantly changing. Uh, traditionally, we've thought about uh, you know, AML treatment stratification uh, based largely on age, and the thought being that older patients, namely over 65 or 70, do um, significantly poorly from the standpoint of their disease biology and their ability to withstand therapy. Um, but more recently, I think we've, we've begun to understand that um, the main reason for treatment failure in AML is, is the disease biology. And we're entering an age where, where patients almost universally are, or in my opinion, should be treated. There's always an option for patients, but the reality is that the, the, the treatments that we have are still failing the majority of patients. So when we think about age, we often think about um, there's not a hard cutoff, but I think most people would agree that once a patient reaches age 75, that the ability to admin safely administer intensive chemotherapy with a reasonable chance of, of, of a response goes down. Um, and we also understand that in patients with adverse karyotypes, um, and we will probably get into this a little bit, but complex cytogenetics, monosomal karyotype, um, and certain uh, specific mutational abnormalities will do more poorly with chemotherapy and should be stratified um, hopefully towards a clinical trial but um, in some cases perhaps um, a, a therapy regimen that does not include chemotherapy if, if the risk of failure is very high from a biologic standpoint so there's still a lot of uh, a lot of hand waving going on with regard to how we should treat patients with with AML and the absolute risk stratification. We have biologic risk stratification, knowing um, how these patients respond to chemotherapy, but we don't have as good of an idea as to how the risk stratification system will parlay into therapies that are not traditional or perhaps more targeted. And those are concepts that are being developed right now with some of the new agents. And uh, so, Mark, at, at the Mayo, how, how are you thinking about this? in terms of the AML patient? How do you stratify the AML patient? Well, I, I would agree with Jeff that I, I think, you know, we need to move away from some of the traditional factors. Uh, certainly, disease biology plays a key role in terms of, you know, both the subtype of AML, uh, their molecular profile, their cytogenetic uh, factors, uh, the comorbidity indices that we talked about earlier are also, you know, playing a role in this. Um, you know, we desperately need new agents in this area, and I think there are some promising ones on the horizon. And so, again, as we often say, a clinical trial is often the best option for a patient if one is available. And Raul, if I can ask you, you know, the, this concept of what, what's a fit patient, what's an unfit <laughs> patient is complicated and, yeah. and there's no standard. What, what, what do you do? So what let's, let's, yeah, so let's go away a little bit. I think a couple of questions come to my mind when I see a patient. Is the patient, what is the chance of cure with chemotherapy alone? And that's mostly determined by cytogenetic risk stratification, whether it's primary or secondary AML, meaning AML that has occurred after previous cancer treatment because for, for secondary AML, a high-risk cytogenic complex cytogenic karyotype, you need a transplant. If the patient is 68 and a poor transplant candidate, from the beginning, I may not want to give him chemotherapy. So is there a cure, the chance of cure with chemo alone? Does the patient need an allotransplant, allogenic transplant for, to be cured? And if the patient doesn't meet any of those criteria, um, I may as well go with a low-intensity treatment uh, regimen. Meaning, meaning not giving chemotherapy or induction chemotherapy altogether, choosing a 5A society being decided being based regimen alone or in combination, so lower intensity regimen. So let's, let's talk about the role of allogeneic transplant. It seems that as we, as transplanters got older, we kept pushing the age. So now, you know, you, you could be any age to get a transplant. So I'm gonna ask you, Jeff, what is the role? What, what, I mean, 
the role of trans allogeneic transplant is still emerging in AML. Um, there have been several randomized studies and meta-analyses analyzing this very question. And in general, um, in patients up to age 60 who have intermediate or high-risk disease based upon um, cytogenetics, they are thought to benefit from transplant, especially on a disease-free survival uh, basis and perhaps uh, uh, some improvement in overall survival in selected subgroups of patients, such as younger patients. Um, I think the general practice around the U.S. right now is to move towards transplant in intermediate or high-risk patients um, as, as a, a general approach. That doesn't mean that every patient is, is, a, is, a, is a candidate. Most of the data that exist to date suggesting the, the benefit of transplant come from sibling uh, allogeneic transplants, so the, the jury is still out on, on the role of uh, you know, unrelated or alternative donor transplants for these patients, especially the intermediate risk patients where uh, there, there is still a reasonable expectation of cure and, and survival with, with standard chemotherapy alone. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions, but in general I would say that um, for the patient that has a sibling donor that is under age 60 and falls into the intermediate or high risk category, um, should be strongly considered for transplant in first remission. Oh, I agree. And secondary AML. For sure, yes. Yeah, but there is a, if you take some of the very bad risk patients, some, many of them don't even respond to transplant. Yeah. So it's kind of a paradox. Your worst patients, I think those with monosomies or... Or to P53, there are some data. Very, very P53. bad patients, even transplant doesn't. And, and that raises the... The question, we can identify probably some patients that will do so bad, and, and we're not advancing so much with chemotherapy. There is a paper here from France that they gave gem gemtuzumab in a third, uh, added gemtuzumab in a safer way. Unfortunately, it was taken off the market here. And they showed a same benefit, but there's no benefit in overall survival. So the chemotherapy is, with a heterogeneity disease as AML, it's, I don't think we'll get much better. So one of the ideas is to take these very bad patients and move very quickly to target the treatments, because we know they're not going to do, because uh, all of these treatments are now studied in the relapse setting, where they already acquired other mutations and they might be, so I think that approach, in the very, very bad patients uh, so, is one so way. If I could ask um, the panel, if you think of N MRD in ALL, which has been well understood, what, what's the role of MRD in AML? And what's the role of MRD prior to transplantation? Maybe, Mark, you can... I was just thinking the same thing, and it's uh, less well developed than in ALL, and I think it's less clear what, what role it has, but I think uh, similar to ALL, its role is, is emerging, and, and I think also similar to ALL, studies where MRD has been measured in patients that are MRD positive prior to transplant are not uh, going to do as well as those patients that are MRD D negative, so it has prognostic significance. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do the transplant. In fact, I think it's still indicated because it's very likely that without transplant, they're going to they're going to relapse. So I think there's more to come in how we use MRD and AML, but I think it's going to emerge in similar fashion. But we have to be careful about which markers and, and how to do it because not all markers are necessarily predictive. I just wanted to make one last comment on the on the role of transplant as well in that traditionally we think about transplanting patients based on cytogenetic risk, but more recently, over the past few years, the molecular genetic uh, risk stratification systems that are coming into play can also affect decisions about transplant. For example, patients that have an NPM1 mutation but are non-mutated for FLT3, studies have shown that those patients overall do not benefit from an allogeneic transplant. So within the molecular subgroup of, of Within the intermediate cytogenetic, cytogenetic risk subgroup, there are molecular subgroups such as the NPM1 positive FLT3 negative patients who you probably don't need to transplant um, and that you can use those tools. And those will be emerging uh, to, to give us further guidance about which types of patients in the intermediate groups are truly high risk and, and perhaps would benefit from transplants but, or lower I, risk. I would even add maybe in the favorable, the, uh, the um, A21 or in version 16, if you have a FLT3, or there's an incidence of, of higher risk molecular markers where you at least may consider it because it puts them into the immediate category.